I, I want you to pray while I'm preaching this morning. Uh, we have no control over the events of life. Uh, you know, things, uh, you know, I, I go down through the road of life and you, you wonder why this happened at this time, why this happened this time. You know, I, I'm not in charge. God's in charge and he knows that. But we're at the end of the book of Peter, and the book of First Peter, and uh, I want to preach on a sobering, serious message this morning. And, I, I, and you pray while I preach, and I mean I'd appreciate you praying for me because the devil's not going to like what I'm going to preach. But uh, I'm going to preach in such a way as try to make the devil mad and God glad. Amen. Amen. And uh, so uh, that's what I'm concerned about today. But uh, I want you to just to be in prayer while I preach. First Peter chapter 5 and verse number 5. The Bible said in verse number 5, everybody there say amen. amen. Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Yea, all of you be subject one to another and be clothed with humility. That's a good, that's a good thing to be clothed with. Amen. For God resisteth the proud. Now, I'm telling you, if God says he resists the proud, he means it. He's not joking about it. He'll pull his grace back from you and giveth grace to the humble. And I may come back and preach on that a little bit later, but that's not where we're at this morning. The Bible said in verse number six, humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. Verse number 7, Casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. That's a wonderful verse to have in your library of verses. Uh, I'm telling you, when the storms of life are blowing and when all the cares are trying to be dumped in your life, if you'll know that verse, Casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. Then he says this in verse number 8, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour, whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren, uh, in your brethren that are in the world. Now I want to preach on verses number eight and the first part of verse number nine, where Peter, the last part of the last chapter in the book that he's writing here. Inspired of the Holy Ghost, is warning Christian people to be sober, to be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, is going about as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. That's an amazing verse. That's serious business. That's not a joke. And then he also, I'm thankful, in verse 9, tells us how to keep from being devoured. Whom resist steadfast in the faith. He said the way to keep from being deceived and devoured by the devil is to resist the devil in the faith. And we see that our Lord Jesus Christ did that in Matthew chapter 4. Now, I want you to take your Bible to 2 Corinthians chapter 2. We're going to look at two or three passages of Scripture and then take off preaching. I'll try to preach fast this morning. 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse number 11. I want you to mark this in. I, I want to preach this morning on this subject. The devices, the, de- the devil's devices, his deception, and his devouring. In this passage that we just read, God warns us that Satan is seeking whom he may devour. In, first, in 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse number 11, he says this, Lest Satan should get an advantage of us, For we are not ignorant of his devices. In 1 Peter chapter 5, we see that he wants to devour us. In 2 Corinthians chapter 2, it says he has devices that he uses to do that. And then I want you to go to 1 Timothy. Just back up from 1 Peter just a few pages to 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse number 14. 1 Timothy chapter 2. And verse number 14, trying to lay a foundation in the Scripture for the message I'm getting ready to preach. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse number 14, the Bible said, And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. Now, here's a third word. The first word we saw that has to do with the devil is the word devour. The second word we saw is devices. And the third word we're seeing here is deception. If you go in the book of Revelation, chapter 20 and verse number 10, you'll find the last thing said about Satan here before he is thrown into the lake of fire. It says this, And the devil that deceived them 
was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beasts and the false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. So we see in this passage of Scripture that the devil has devices and he deceives through those devices and he devours people. I want to pray this morning that God will preach this message through us. And Lord, I pray today that you help us and fill us with your Holy Spirit. Help us to preach with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven. I pray right now, God, against the devil. I pray and plead the name and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ against the devils of hell. God, tonight, if we're not careful, we're just like Jim taught in Sunday school. We're just being foolish. We're just bouncing through life with this foolish world and its vanity. And we're not, Lord, seeing and understanding how Satan is ripping and tearing and devouring our families, our homes, our lives. And God, but all around us, we intuitively know that this nation is being devoured. And it's being devoured, God, through our families and our churches and our homes and our individuals, our children, Lord, our marriages. God, He is devouring all around us. And Father, today, if I'm anything of a pastor, God, I want you to help me to preach today in such a way that we would be sober and vigilant. That we'd be aware and we'd be doing something about it. That, we'd be, that we would resist Him steadfastly in the faith. That our homes and our marriages and our children and our families and this church, and Lord, yea, even our nation would not be devoured by the devil. God, You said that He is walking about seeking whom He may devour. God, make it real to us this morning and awaken us by the power of the Holy Ghost. And by the truth of thy word, may the light of your truth shine into our hearts today and remove the darkness of our vanity and the darkness of the blindness that the God of this world has blinded our eyes with. God, I pray do that today. And I'll thank you, Lord, that I pray that you'll be glorified. And I pray save the people in this building that are lost today. And I pray God awaken daddies and mothers and young people today. And God help us to do something with this message, to not just be hearers of the word, but doers also. And I'll thank you and praise you. And fill us again and preach us with the power of God in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, I want you to know something. The devil, uh, even though he, you know, he can just, he's not omniscient. He's not omnipresent. In fact, he can only be in one place at one time. But the Bible does say that he walks about uh, this earth seeking him he may devour. He's not all powerful. And the Bible is very clear that he can be defeated and is defeated through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And by the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. And he's defeated through the Word of God being used by the child of God. And I'm thankful for this old precious book because if we read this book and and meditate upon it, it will show us that there's a predictable pattern that Satan has when he's seeking to devour somebody. In other words, you can literally predict how Satan is going to try to devour you or your family or your loved ones. And the Bible teaches in Genesis chapter 3, and I want you to go ahead and get turned to Genesis chapter 3, because that's where we're going to look at this predictable pattern. But in Genesis chapter 3, Satan used a pattern to deceive and to devour Adam and Eve. Then in Matthew chapter 4, watch that, he used the same pattern to try to take down our Lord Jesus Christ. If you remember, there's three things he tempted Eve with in Genesis 3. There were three things he tempted Christ with in the wilderness temptation. And in 1 John chapter 2 and verse 16, it literally lists these three things. It says it's the lust of the flesh, it's the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Those are the predictable pattern that Satan will try to destroy you with. It's really not that complicated. It's really not that mystic. It's really not that uh, foggy. If we just read the Bible and we can predict how Satan is going to work in your family and your life. Now, the Bible says, I want you to go back in 1 Peter chapter 5, as you hold Genesis chapter 3. I want you, did you read that text good? Here's what it said. Be sober. It said, be vigilant. It said, for your adversary. Your adversary. You have an adversary. And it names him the devil. I mean, a lot of liberal preachers don't believe in the devil, but God still tells you there's a devil. And the devil still believes in the devil. Amen. And he said, he's as a roaring lion, he's walking about. Where is he walking? He walks to your home. He walks to this church. He walks to our governmental place. He's walking about this earth, seeking whom, the Bible said, seeking. You know what? If you're seeking something, you're on the path. You're looking for somebody that you can get. And he says, when he finds them, that his desire and goal is to devour them. I want you to ask you something, a question. Are you aware of that truth? I want to tell you something, if you're not aware that the devil will devour you and your family and your life, you're stupid this morning. 
You're more ignorant than a pet coon. I'm telling you what, we got a generation of American people walking into churches, walking out of churches, and acting like that God doesn't really mean what he's saying. Living like God doesn't really mean that the devil will literally devour your family. I don't know about you, but as a pastor, as a preacher, as a Christian, as a man in this country, about all I can see is the devouring of the devil in this nation right now. Six out of ten homes are being devoured by the devil. I don't tell you about 80% of the children being born in cities right now have families that have been devoured. They don't even know who their daddy is. They don't, they're being raised without a father. Uh, the very institution of marriage, the institution of home, the institution of family is being devoured. The churches of America are being devoured by the devil this morning. And I'm saying this thing is real and God's saying, well, to be sober. I'm saying this, that, that, that we need to understand that there's a pattern and that pattern is predictable, but we can prepare to, to resist and conquer Satan and his keeping from devourance. Now the Bible said that he has devices. That he deceives and that the end thing is he devours. Individuals, marriages, homes, families, churches, and nations. There is a predictable pattern that Satan will use. You're at Genesis chapter 3. Let's look and see what he does and watch this predictable pattern. I'm going to give you three or four things and let you out. And here it is. Number one, the first thing he'll do in chapter 3, he said this. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, underline this in your Bible. Yea, hath God said. The first predictable pattern how Satan will devour you is to, cast number one, cast doubt on the Word of God. Let me tell you something. If the devil can get you and sow seeds of doubt in your mind and in your heart about the authority and the veracity and the truthfulness of the Word of God, you're, set, you're just now being set up to be devoured by the devil. She was being set up when she allowed Satan to say, Yea, hath God said. You say, Reggie, what are you talking about? I'm talking about the devil can sow seeds of doubt in your mind about sin. In other words, sin's not really what it is. He can sow seeds of doubt in your mind about salvation. He can sow seeds of doubt in your mind about the second coming. Brother, I'm going to tell you something. He is coming back. You can mark it down in your day book. The Bible said Christ is returning. He is returning. I'm saying he can sow seeds of doubt in your mind about separation. He can sow seeds of doubt about the Savior. Let me tell you something. All the cults and all the isms and the wisdoms that ever will be in our are because Satan sowed seeds of doubt in the hearts of those people. He can sow seeds of doubt about the sentencing. I want to tell you something. Do you really believe there's a hell? Do you really believe that God, the Bible said, they'll be cast into the lake of fire? But if you're not careful, Satan, yeah, is there really a hell? Is there really a heaven? Did Jesus really exist? Was he the Son of God? Are you saved by grace? Is there something else I need to do? He's constantly, if you're not careful, throwing these doubtful suggestions to your mind that cast doubt upon the Word of God. And I'm not going to stay here a long time, but I'm going to say this to you this morning. This is the, you can predict it. I'm guaranteeing if Satan comes at you, he'll come at you exactly like he came Eve. If he's ever going to devour you, he'll start out by casting doubt upon the Word of God. That's what all these perversion Bibles are about we got in America. Let me tell you, so America was a voice of authority when she had one Bible. Now you go into a Christian bookstore, and if you're lucky, you'd be lucky if a Christian store even has an authorized version. There are all these rinky dink, pinky, I mean stupid, idiotic, humanistic versions of the Bible. Our churches are dead because these, you know what those versions all do? They all cast doubt upon the Word of God. Whenever you hear somebody say, well, that should have been a better, different translation or a better translation would have been, and all that garbage, all that is doing is casting doubt upon the Word of God. Let me show you how powerful casting doubt upon the Word of God is. In our government run hell holes called schools now, we've got a doctrine of evolution is being taught like a religion to our kids. And you know what evolution does? It calls God a liar, blatant out there, and I don't care what you believe in. I'm going to tell you something this morning. If you believe in theistic evolution, I don't believe you're even saved. You know why? Because you're barefaced, bald faced, calling God Almighty a liar, that He can't even keep His record straight in the book. If you believe in evolution, you're a liar, but you've called God a liar. And Satan has devoured you by casting doubt in the beginning. God created the heaven and the earth. You believe, you've had that little seed thrown and all, and all across this nation. It's no wonder we're turned into a hellhole nation that the Muslims think ought to be destroyed. We've allowed our educators to cast doubt in the minds of our little children 
five to six days a week in summer school and every other little government program and take them kids in there and show them charts of monkeys and fish and all that kind of junk. And here's, here comes a guy pretty soon. And basically all we're really doing is saying the Bible is nothing but a fairy tale lie. Kids, here's the truth. And we have cast doubt upon the minds of the Word of God and the minds of our children until now we've raised up the second and third generation who are a bunch of perverts because they're cast doubt upon the Word of God. Let me tell you something. God being my helper, I said whenever God saved me and I got in this book, I said I will never allow the devil to cast doubt like that in my children's mind by that kind of junk. You listen to me this morning. If he ever devours you, it'll be because he started out casting doubt upon the Word of God. Some of you wonder if God loves you. Let me tell you something, knucklehead. If he gave his only begotten son for your sorry low down hide, what else can he do to tell you that he loves you? You're whining around and whipping around thinking God doesn't love you. Why don't you repent of that garbage attitude and get right with God and say, Bless the Lamb of God if I die broke, if I die busted, but I'm saved, I've got it made. Amen. I'm talking about this morning that is predictable. He'll cast down the Word of God. I haven't seen like in my land this whole country. It's just preachers, better translations. Preachers just casting down upon the Word of God. It should have said this. In the Hebrew it says this. In the Greek it says that. Let me tell you something. You don't need Greek to, to understand thou shalt not commit adultery. You don't need Hebrew to understand whosoever looks at the bottom woman with lust in his heart commit adultery already with her. You don't need Greek to understand thou shalt not steal. You don't need Greek to understand thou shalt not bear false witness. That's a bunch of hogwash out of hell. It's straight from the devil casting down upon the Word of God. Did you know something? You can go around and talk to people nowadays 50 years ago in this country. I mean, the old lost drunk said, yeah, that's the Bible. I know that's the Word of God. You know what? Nowadays they'll say, oh, it's a man written book. Well, which one are you talking about? One says this, one says that. Satan cast down the Word of God in this whole country, dying and going to hell over one predictable pattern of the devil in casting doubt upon the Word of God. Let me tell you something. If you ever do anything for your kids, you tell your kids this. This is the Word of God. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my Word shall not pass away. The grass with them, the fire flames, but the Word of our God shall stand forever. By the way, you'll be judged out of it when you stand before Almighty God. You say, Reggie, what are you talking about? I'm talking about, they talk about it's got mistakes in it. And it's archaic language. Oh, no, it's not archaic language. You just got sin in your heart and you're looking for some greasy book to make you feel better about your sin. That's all you are. Amen. I'm talking about what we need to be like Abraham, who in the book of Romans chapter 4 said that he believed God. He believed God and he staggered not. At the promises of God. Why does the Bible use that language? Staggered not. It's because the devil's going to throw stuff at you to try to get you to stagger at the promises of God. Try to create it down in your mind. Let me tell you something. We're going to have a funeral service for a brother in the Lord this afternoon. And I'm going to tell you something. Have you ever stood beside the casket of a loved one and looked and wondered if you'd ever see them again? Let me tell you what the Bible says. It said for the child of God to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. I'm going to tell you something. We need to quit staggering. Let me tell you something. He's not. Brother Richard not in the ground. He's in glory. Amen. Listen, I'm not staggering at the Word of God. I'm not up here going to willy willy and out. Let me tell you something. We need to get back to believing this book. I'm saying this to you all about Noah. Oh, and the Bible said Noah by faith. By faith in what? Being warned of God. Prepared an ark to the saving of his house. You know that's the difference between Noah and the whole rest of the world was? He didn't let the devil cast doubt upon the Word of God. That alone was the principle that saved that man's life. Number one, before the devil can devour you, he'll have to get you to cast, he'll have you to start doubting the Word of God. Number two, we've got to go. Second thing, he, a predictable pattern is, he'll convince you that disobedience can be gotten by with. He'll convince you that you can sin and get by with it. Brother, I'm going to tell you, the Holy Ghost is running double track on us this morning, Jim. I'll tell you, Jim brought out that thing. He said, God says, if you lie, you'll not be unpunished. You're not going to escape. But the devil will make you think, you know what he told Eve up there, look at verse number, chapter 3, and verse number 4, the serpent said unto the woman, ye shall not surely die. He's lying his head off to her. You know what he was saying, you can sin and get by with it, Eve. It's no big deal. God doesn't mean what he says. He started out questioning, doubting the Word of God, then he blatantly denied the Word of God. I'm saying to you this this morning, that you, the, the Bible says it's amazing to me how the devil can convince us that although others were devoured, although others were punished, although others had killed them, we somehow know they can get by. 
You know what he'll tell you? You're too slick. You're sharper than they are. You know I mean, you're, you're more weasley. You, you'll get around it. God, may, them other folks might have got it. But, oh, David might have paid for his sin with four children. But, no, you won't have to. Samson might have died in the hands of the Philistines, but you won't. Achan might have been stoned and burned with fire and all of his children, but it won't happen to you. I'm saying this is one that he'll try to convince you. First of all, he'll cast doubt upon the Word. Number two, he'll try to convince you that disobedience to the Word of God can be gotten by with it. But the Bible says, be sure your sin will find you out. The Bible said the wages of sin is death. The Bible said the finishing of sin is death. I'm going to tell you something. When you think you can sin and get by with it, you're nuts. You're crazy. I'm going to tell you, you're loony as a goon. You're idiotic and you better wake up or he'll devour you and your family. You're going to say, well, what are you talking about? I'm talking about some of you guys sitting around watching pornography. That's what I'm talking about. You think it ain't going to devour you. It's going to, it's going to ruin your marriage, your children. And God's going to judge your family for generations over it. I'm talking about some of you kids that's got rock music and, and all that garbage out there. And you sit around listening to all that trash and filth and nastiness. And you're running with the world and you think you're going to get by with it. You're stupid. You sound like that kind of preacher. Let me tell you something. I don't care what you like. I'm not up here to stroke your neck and make you feel good. Great grease will slide to hell for you. You better wake up and understand that the devil is out there. He make you think that you can get by with sin. I will tell you, you're out there fornicating and you think you can get by with it. You're an idiot. You're up committing adultery and think you can get by with it. You think I'm so stupid to think that this many people walk into church and there's not enough sin here to drown us all in the, in the lake of fire. You're crazy. When I say this is the first church of Salvage Yard, I mean exactly what I say. Brother, I'm going to tell you something. If anybody, let, let, let him to stand to take he left he what? Paul. I'll tell you what God said. He said a bunch of preachers, a bunch of sleeping dogs. Said they won't bark. Won't warn the congregation about the devil prowling around. I don't tell you what the truth is known. What's going on in this congregation right now probably shock us all. It probably shock us all what some of you have done this week. If you say, I want to tell you something, listen to me. You say, why do you know so much about sin? Because I'll tell you what, I was born a sinner, amen? And I've been dealt with by the devil. I've been tempted by the devil. I've been walked by, I've been assaulted by the devil. I know what sin can do to you. I'm talking about, listen, I want you to look over yonder. Eve believed that her sin wasn't going to get her. The devil convinced her, you shall not surely die. Let me tell you something, she did die in that day. She died spiritually before Almighty God. That's why you've got to be born again in the Spirit of God. I want you to look down the road and I want you to see a man by the name of Adam. He's got, he's got an old stick and whatever he's got there, a shovel. And he's digging out a grave. He's digging out a grave. And he's throwing dirt. And he's four foot down. He's five foot down. But I want you to look further over there. I want you to see a woman who's screaming and wailing and bobbing back and forth, back and forth over the, over the beaten and battered and bruised and bloated body of a son that was killed by her own other son. Oh God, I listen to the devil. Oh, God, he told me this wouldn't happen. Oh, God, I'm burying my son today. Let me tell you something. That's the history of mankind. It's believing a stinking lie that your sin will not find you out. And let me tell you something. Of whom much is given, much is required. I'm telling you, if you're sitting in this church house this morning and you're playing the hypocrite, buddy, you get ready for a, for a spiritual atomic bomb to go off in your family. The devil's a liar, always has been, always will be. Mark it down. Number three, first thing is he'll do a predictable pattern. He'll cast out for the Word of God. Then he'll make you think you won't pay for your sin. Then thirdly, he'll always circumvent God-ordained authority. Now listen to me good. Adam was her authority. I'm going to give you something you've probably never heard in your life. The Scripture never, never records God ever speaking to Eve till after she had sinned. Always Adam. You say, what's the story? God's a God of authority. God works through authority. Always did, always will. He didn't speak to Eve till after she had sinned. Are you listening to me? What's the message? God protects people through God-ordained authority. And what Satan always does is he'll come around and circumvent authority. That's why the candy is on the low shelves at the grocery store. Enticing kids to go around, grab it. Once it's in their hand, what are you going to do? Buy it. 
Satan circumvents God-ordained authority is the third move he'll always make on you. He'll do like Jim said. He'll get you to go to some other source rather than to the Bible. Let me tell you something. That Bible is the final absolute source of authority on this globe. It is the final authority. And he'll always get you to go around that authority. What did he do? Satan didn't go to Adam and said, Now, Adam, I'll tell you what, I'd like to talk to your wife for a while uh, by herself. No, he snuck around, subtle, talked to the wife, talked to those under authority. You say, Reggie, what are you talking about here? I'm talking about that he always goes around any time, let me tell you something, any time anyone is separating you from God-ordained authority, going around your God-ordained authorities, the devil is closing in on you. Every time. I've said this over and over again. I'm going to say it till it rings in your soul. Young people, don't you let anything separate you between you and your parents. The devil will try to get you doing this and doing that and doing this. And, and hey, adults, you're the same. I'm the same. If Satan can get us to go around the God-ordained authority, he'll nail our hide and devour our lives every time. I won't tell you the Word of God is our authority. In a home, the father is the authority. The parents are the authority over children. In a church, the pastor is the authority. I'm going to tell you something. Listen, our government education system in this country is the most circumventing, authoritative system I know about. They're circumventing the home. They're going around. I'll tell you what they've got. Some people are so scared. They're afraid to whoop their own kids. Amen. They're circumventing authority. I'm going to tell you what the church, public schools do. They're circumventing the authority of the Word of God every day of their life. Teaching sex education. Can I give you a little bit of horse sense? You don't need anybody to teach you sex education. Can I give you kids something good? You don't even need mom and dad to teach you all about sex before marriage. Discover each other. Huh? You sound like the kind of preaching. It'll do you some good. Oh, no, you've got a problem with that, but you don't have problems sending Susie over there to sit down in 14 science classes with all kinds of pictures and perversion. I mean, for, for four or five class years of school. Oh, that's fine. But a preacher gets up and tells you the best thing you can do is get married and find out about each other. Amen? You're kind of, oh, I didn't know anybody was supposed to say something like that in the book. Amen? Let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. I sat in them stupid sex education classes over there. And then I turned around and watched half my class get knocked up pregnant before they got married. I watched their marriages blow apart. I watched the, I watched the, I, I've seen girls in our class, literally class, pregnant school, arms on their head on their arms, sobbing in class. Because everybody got fired up in sex education class circumventing their parents. I'll tell you what they're doing. They're teaching all kinds of garbage in these schools that we would not allow if we knew about it. They know now, you know what they've done? Circumvent authority. They act like, you know what? You know what gets me? It really bugs the soup out of me. In the medical world, they think the second you walk in that hospital, lay on you, body, soul, and spirit, they're nuts. Hmm. In some churches. Let me tell you something. Circumventing authority. You know who I should work through in this church? If Brother Ralph, if there's a problem with one of his boys, you know who I need to talk to? That man right there. I don't need to go around his authority. He's their daddy. If I do what God wants me to do, I'll work through the authority of those children. That's their daddy. If we're not careful, we're coming in churches and separating families. You go in the average church and a bunch of teenagers sitting in the back, texting each other. Showing each other the blood-sucking parasite marks on their neck from being out at some party the night before. Playing spirituality. Planned Parenthood. All about circumventing authority. No notification of the parents for an abortion. What's that? Going around authority. We don't want your mom and dad knowing anything about us killing their grandchild. Predictable. Number one, cast doubt on the Word of God. Number two, convince you that you can sin and get by with it. Number three, and I could preach on each one of these subjects for a complete hour and not even touch them. But number four, confuse the home. Predictable pattern. Cast doubt on the Word of God. Convince them sin is not going to cost them. Circumvent God-ordained authority. 
brings confusion to the home. Interesting point. You just, throw, you just, you just put this in your pocket. How I many knows what the first thing Adam did after he sinned? He became a mason or a Mormon. Made himself an apron. Well, you're quiet now. That's what he did. Does that tell you anything? You better perk up your ears. Confusion in the home. Did you realize this, that for a period of time, Adam was saved, Eve was not? That you had an unequal yoke in the home? That's what Satan's after. He brought division in the home. And here's an interesting point. Now, I know, I know all the theology and I know all the typology about Adam, the type of Christ, and Eve, the type of the church. I know all about that. I know all about the fact that there's a doctrinal position in there where, where Adam voluntarily identified with her for her salvation. I understand that. But if you take the story on its surface basis, did you know that the one who sinned pulled the, pulled the one in authority down to their level. She gave unto the man. Adam didn't pull her back up. Eve pulled him down. Now there's a pattern. That if you do not lead spiritually, I've, I, I'm literally at the point of where I believe this. Everybody says, oh, the first sin was when Adam and Eve took other. No, no. I believe the original sin was when Adam didn't guard his home. You just think about it. You know, you don't, don't, don't bank up on that and get into a big de- theological debate. You just think about it. Yeah. Eve brought Adam down. And when, when that happened, it brought disorder and confusion in the home. Buddy, from the moment she took that fruit, she brought confusion into that home. And do you know how Satan devours your family? By confusion in the home. Let me tell you something. This nation, God is not the author of confusion. Satan is. Satan's a, revolt, a role reversal. And if you read about the curse, you'll find out that God dealt with all that junk in the curse. But you've got Eve here messing up God's order. I've said this and preached this before. There's three things killing this nation, and it has to do with this confusion in the home. We don't have spiritual leaders in our homes in America anymore. We don't have men who who pray with their families and who read the Bible with their families and who are literally... And, you know, and by the way, you can do all that. Did you know and still not really be a spiritual leader? Because a spiritual leader establishes the structure and he establishes the rule and there's certain things go on here and certain things don't go on here. You need to read together. How are you going to know how, how to run your home? You, you need to pray together. God knit your heart together. But I'm saying you can even do all that. You need to set up this. The Bible teaches that the husband is head of the wife even as Christ is head of the church. The Bible teaches that parents are over children. The husband is to love his wife as Christ loves the church. The wife is to be submissive to her husband as the church is to be submissive to, to Christ. But you know, there's really three, three things that I just in the bare raw things that I see killing this nation. And it has to do with this predictable pattern that Satan uses in confusion in the home. Number one, sissy men. This country's got nothing but a bunch of sissy men in it. I'm talking about beer gutted, tattooed, necklace wearing, lazy, coffee shop retirement, restaurant clowns. Bunch of lazy, stinking, sissy men who won't stand up for nothing in this country. All they're interested in is just making a living and keeping quiet. While the devil devours their family, devours their children, their grandchildren. Let me tell you something. We need to get some men with some backbone and some guts in them who know what they believe, why they believe it, and will fight the good fight of faith. Let me tell you something else. We've got a bunch of sissy men. A bunch of blood-sucking parasites drawing disability off his neighbors that work and paying taxes. Amen! Blood-sucking parasites. Won't work, don't have any... And learn how to milk the system. Porch monkeys in these cities. Drive down through these cities, sitting there with a can of beer in one hand and a 357 in the other. Waiting for night to fall, to crawl the streets, robbing, raping, pillaging. Gotten so bad in this country, police are admitting they don't even, they don't even, they just quarter it off. They just kind of seal off the outside edges. Men that won't leave their families. Let me give you an illustration. You walk up to a house, you know, or something like that, or talk to somebody, he's a Marine, man. He's a pop gutted Marine sitting over there with tattoos up and down each arm, you know, with a can of Bud Light in his hand like that. He's sitting over there watching 
some stupid, you know, John Wayne movie. That's, that helps your life, don't it? Yeah. Or stupid Andy Griffith. I'm done with him. Get on there and promote health care across this country when he's up there wanting to soak his, get his hand in the till. You don't like that? I don't care. I know if I preach against Andy Griffith, some of you will quit church. I guess that's what's going. If that got you, get it. Amen. I tell anybody, get on and, and hurt our country like that and be used to that bunch to do that. But you got that beer gutted, I mean, tattooed. You know, he's got a big gold vest on. He's sitting there watching Andy Griffith. And you knock on and say, listen, and, he, and you say, you know, what's your name? He says, oh, yeah, sure, I'm down to beer joint here. I'll back to I've whooped eight guys with a bar stool. I mean, he is tough. You say, well, listen, why don't you come to church Sunday? He's got an 80-pound prune sitting over sucking on a cigarette. And he turns over and says, honey, uh, you want to go to church Sunday? He's got to ask an 80-pound friend whether he can go to church or not. That's the kind of men we got in this country. You know I'm telling you the truth. we got a bunch of sissies in this country. Sissy men. That's what's killing this country. We're never going to have revival until we got some men of God leading their homes, leading this nation again. Sissy men's what got us the president we got now. Men who don't take... Responsibility. His father would not take responsibility. How do you think he don't take responsibility for nothing? It's George Bush's fault. Everything's George Bush's fault. You got it, man. He's a sissy. You can tell him I said so. If he's not a sissy, take responsibility. Quit blaming everybody else in the world for all your problems. Amen. Hey, oh, we have a wonderful time here this morning. We got these little white handed, soft handed, effeminate, fag and queer sodomites, abominable reprobates. You listen to me. Effeminate, this horrible, abominable sin in the sight of Almighty God. I'll tell you what, some of you boys out here, I begin to wonder if you aren't shaving your armpits and wearing panties. Amen. You know why? I can already see you're not going to lead your family for God. You're too busy trying to be cool. You're already a wimp. This country is chock full of men who, if it wasn't for their wives, would never darken the door of a church. You probably shave your underarms. Probably get your hair fixed in the salon too, don't you? Bunch of sissy men. I was over at the jailhouse the other night, preaching on rebuilding the walls. Hey, you got to get this junk out of your life, get the rubbish out of your life to rebuild the walls. I said, and I said, rubbish like rock and roll music. I said, like Ozzy Osbourne. I listen. God's truth. Boy said, oh, Ozzy, I love Ozzy. I said, bud, can I tell you something? Ozzy's the reason you're here. And you love Ozzy. Batting off bad heads, drinking blood at concerts. Satan worshiper. He says, I got all his albums, I got all his CDs, and I love Ozzy. I said, You're stupid. You're ignorant. You need to get rid of Ozzy. Because Ozzy's going to take you to hell. You know what? We got a bunch of boys, ain't got enough guts to stand alone. I said something about the other night, stand alone. You, you thought I'd talk about going to the moon or something. Oh, uh, I don't like to be alone. But you sissy man. Ah, you guys. You're too quiet this morning, amen. I don't tell you something. I don't preach. I don't preach to hide off the devil. I want to make it so hard on the devil here. I mean to tell you, I don't, I, I, I'm tell you what I, you say, oh, already. I was hoping you'd get softer when you get older. Mm -hmm. I don't tell you what I mean to preach. I mean, I mean, I, I'll tell you what these. Grand, I walked in here this morning. and I mean, here comes a whole flock of boys about that high. Just cutting through. I said, Oh God, help me to preach so those boys know the truth. Then the second thing is killing this country, silly women. They got their hard hat in their lunchbox, headed over here to do a flag all day long. Stop, go, stop, go. Boy, that's a career, ain't it? That's exciting. Their baby's down at the babysitter with a pervert. They're up there, stop, go, stop, go, stop, go. That's real sharp. Silly, stupid women who perverted their role in life, whom the devil has brought confusion to their home, and probably some sissy man back there changing diapers somewhere or vacuuming in the house. 
Letting perverts keep your kids, trading your children off for a career, that's the stupidest thing you'll ever do in your life. Hey, keep her at home. Whatever happened to be a holy woman of old, godly women of old. Sitting around watching, and if they are home, they're sitting around watching TV, eating tater chips with a Pepsi in one hand, and then run off down to YMCA. You're a stupid hypocrite. You're a stinking hypocrite. You're a hypocrite to sit on your couch, eat potato chips and drink Pepsi and moon pies. What's that filth? Then go down to YMCA. No, 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 honey. It's not about your weight and condition. It's about you seducing some man down there at YMCA. You ain't got this boy fooled. No. What's the matter with you folks? You've been down to YMCA. I thought everybody had amen. They're not, you don't go down to Y. What's your problem? We got to do it. Is that right? They're not worried about your weight. They're wa- hey, hey, listen. All they're looking for is a tan and bread and tight britches and a low cut, to, low cut top. And then they finally snag some boy and they become a nag, rebellious, argue with their husband, wife. It's like a dripping rain day and night. We got a bunch of silly women led away with divers' lust. A bunch of seductive Jezebels that couldn't cook a bean or, har- or hardly boil water. Their homes are dirty. Their kids are filthy. They don't know how to be a keeper of home. And they try to look like some Hollywood slut. You women, get your head up. We're not praying yet. Amen? Yeah, we start doing that. No, we're not praying yet. I see some, unless you think I'm stupid, I have watched it. I've, I've prayed, I've pleaded. But I will tell you something. No creature in the world is going to take the substitute of you being a daddy. You get mad at me if you don't to. Am I your enemy because I tell you the truth? Then we got this stupidity. Join the army. I mean, you know, there's a side of me that appreciates anybody that goes to fight for our country. But can I tell you girls something? You're awful handy here on the front seat. You join the army, you will either cave in or get raped in two months. Most likely. Do you think that you got 500 guys in the prime of their testosterone life and three women in the, in the group and get in a barracks or a foxhole or a submarine or a ship? How stupid. How ignoramus. And can I tell you, girls, just the honest truth, most of them don't get raped. They just finally give up. Now listen to me, I... I know you think I'm an old fuddy-duddy, idiotic, Bible-banging, hellfire and brimstone preacher don't know nothing. I know a lot more about it than you think I do. The Bible knows all about it. Then there's these silly women who leave their husband and you let working taxpayers house you, feed you, dental you, doctor you, while you move your live-in boyfriend in and sit and watch The View and Winfrey, and all those sluts and whores. And I'm going to tell you, if you're doing that, you need to repent, and you need to get on this altar and say, God, forgive me. You're sorry. You're sorry. You're a stinking thief. You're a blood-sucking parasite. Milk in the system for all you can. We, this country is so full of that garbage. I'm going, to tell, I'm, I'm going to tell the liberals something. There's going to come a day when there's no tax money left to blood suck the working people of America to, to support $26 billion teacher hike and, so, and keep, the, keep these federal union employees going. Did you know that no federal employee has lost one benefit since the recession? No federal employee has taken any cut in pay since the recession. And the whole idea of that is to suck more and more people into the system. So pretty soon we're overbalanced and the government just has to take not only GM and everything else, but they've got to take farmland and everything else over so they can nanny, nanny state this whole country. Now, I mean what I'm telling you. This is how we're devoured. Number three, spoiled children. So what's running this country. Let me tell you something. You may think that that stuff, if you swallowed in, you think that's too tough. What you are, if you've already let the devil cast doubt on the Word of God. The Bible said, he that loveth his son chasteneth him betimes. That means while he's early. 
He said, you, you chasing your child, you'll set, spare his soul from hell. By the way, can I tell you, spare the rods full of the child is not in the Bible. So quit quoting it like it is a Bible verse. It's not in the, not in the Bible. The principle is, but the verse, is, that, that little saying is not. The Bible teaches very clearly, you beat him with a rod and you set, save his soul from hell. Blueness of the stripes have cleansed away evil in the heart. Yes, sir. Some of you in this church house, your kids talk back to you. You ain't got enough sense to know that the devil is prowling around your house. Yeah. Let me tell you something. My kids can tell you. I never did take no back talk from them. And I'll tell you something. They'd get double whooping for and that's ever talking back to that woman sitting over their mother. They didn't even have to back talk her. If they looked at her cockeyed, it was on. I'm going to tell you something today. They love their mother. Whether you want to admit it or not, your stinking little depraved, sin-cursed little child needs to be taught something. But halo is nothing but two horns grow together. You think it's a halo. Spoiled children won't mind. They learn to manipulate you. And you know what the worst part about it is? You think it's cute. You're crazy. You're nuts. And you're going to get payday someday for it. Wake up. Let them have anything, do anything, go anywhere, be anything they want. I told my boys this week, or at least two of them I think were standing there, I said, I pray that God will always keep you poor enough to make your kids, you have to work the daylights out of your kids to make a living. This is part of that whole deal about sissy boys. I'm going to tell you something. You boys, every boy in this building needs to know what it is to buck some hay bales. If you don't get Donnie a baler out there, Donnie baling some hay, let's get everybody. I want you to have one day a bucket hay bales. I want you to have one day of cleaning out. By the way, tonight I'm preaching on five things you'll never do in the hog pen. You need to be here tonight and bring your lost loved ones and your backslidden friends with you. But I'm telling you something. We need. I, I want to say something. I am proud of the young people of this church that work and get out and try to find jobs and work and not afraid to hustle and work and, and get out there. We're creating a bunch of kids, a bunch of lazy, a bunch of sissies because you're spoiling them. Yeah. Now, can I say something? I've wanted to say this for years. Taking out the trash is not work. <laughs> Amen. Amen. It's just something that needs to be done. Right. Now Johnny, oh, Johnny worked hard when he was growing up. He had to take out the trash. <laughs> makes me sick. Amen. i tell you what you need to do. Is, but you, know, you, you, need, you know what you, your dad needs to buy you for Christmas is a chainsaw. <laughs> oh, no. First of all, he needs to buy you a splitting mall. Amen. So get out there and split that wood. Then chainsaw. I mean, all went along. Just cut wood, cut wood, cut wood. Oh, Andy Simpson. By the way, I'm going to see Andy in a few days. And Andy said when he was growing up, he thought his name was go get wood. He said, I thought that's what my name was. Go get wood. Go get wood. Go get wood. Man alive, you need to work them. Work them. Work them. That's what's wrong with this country. Sissy men. Silly women, spoiled children. I'm talking about confusion in the home. I'm talking about devices and deception of the devil that devours your life and those you love. The devil, he'll, have it. he'll cast down the Word of God, convince you you, can't get, you can get by with sin. He'll circumvent authority. He'll confuse the home. And finally, you look at verse 24, chapter 3. Verse 23 and verse 24, Therefore the Lord God sent him forth from the garden of Eden to, the ground, to till the ground from whence he was taken. So he drove out the man, and he placed at the east of the garden of Eden cherubims, and flaming sword was turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. Did you see verse number 4, he drove out the man? Do you know what the devil's predictable pattern is? Do you know what the end of it, the result is? Cut you off from God. That's where his thing's headed, is to cut you off from God, cut you away from the presence of God. This is where it's really headed. Cut you off from the Lord. Cut you off. Carve up your family. Consume you. I'm going to tell you something. I'm, I'm really bothered. Now, I'm going to tell you something right now. I'm going to say as your pastor, I'm going to say it as a, from the depths of my heart, and I love you. But there is something happening in this land that is setting this country up for the absolute collapse. And it is this Internet and all of its pornography and its filth in it. It is turning American people into perverts that are going to be like they were in the days of Noah. Their mind was only evil continually. 
I mean, it's getting to where, folks, you don't even know, it, you're, you don't know who to have your kids around hardly. You don't have any idea. Let me tell you something. I don't want to create suspicion, but the truth about it is you better watch your kids, who your kids is with, where they go and what they do. You listen to me. I mean, tell you, folks, you, I mean, I'm, I, I drive through Mountain Grove and I see little old kids out there on the sidewalk, two, three, four, five-year-old kids playing out in the sidewalk. Not an adult in sight. I want to tell you something. I, I, I hate to say it, but we're in the last days. It is just what Jesus said. Boy, if there's anything that fires me up, my Lord told us exactly how it's going to be. He said when the days he comes back, he said it'll get like Lot, it'll get like Sodom, it'll get like it was in the days of Noah. And we're seeing it. Daniel said, Daniel said this, the latter days that knowledge would run to and fro throughout the earth. You tell me if it ain't running to and fro throughout the whole earth. Brother, I'm going to tell you what the Lord's coming back. Now, you listen to me. I don't know whether you're saved here or not. I hope and pray that you are. But if you're not saved here today, the first thing you need to do is get saved. You need to get saved. I'm talking about old-fashioned repentance of your sin and asking Jesus to have mercy upon you and save you by his blood and sacrificial death on the cross. You say, Rich, what are you talking about? I'm talking about in Job chapter 1. Did you know the Bible said that God said to Satan, Whence comest thou? And Satan answered this, From going to and fro in the earth and from walking up and down in it. In Job chapter 2, he said the same thing. Did you know he's doing the same thing today? I close with this. A young man named Danny. Danny was a stringy haired drug head. Lived in an old beat down trailer house with a wife and two kids that he hardly ever was around. In strange circumstance, Danny wound up at a revival meeting, and Danny, I mean, Danny's one of these people, he's, if you're going to live for the devil, he's going to go whole hog or nothing. But if he got saved, he's going to go whole hog or nothing. And old Danny supposedly got saved. I'm not his judge. Oh, Danny got saved. Boy, I mean, tell you what, he would go to every revival meeting. He'd go to every church service. I mean, he was reading his Bible. He was growing in the Lord. He was excited how God had delivered him out of, the, out of darkness. And old Danny got called to preach. He said, God's called me to preach. Several months down the road, a little old church out in the country, wanted Danny to come fill in for him. Then they wanted him to pastor. He was running about six or eight people. And Danny started preaching in three months' time, had that church up to 100 people. Boy, I mean, God was just moving. And then something happened. There's some offerings started coming in that church, you know, 100 people offering. And Danny got the financial bind from some stuff in his past. And Danny pillared into the church offering. Of course, the church found out about it. He had to leave. And when he left, you see what happened was he cast, the devil cast doubt on Danny's mind about stealing. Oh, Danny, you won't hurt anything. You can replace that money at some other time. No battle ever. Not. See, first thing, cast down the word of God. Second thing, said you won't get caught. Third thing, he did circumvent authority because he didn't listen to the word of God. No, Danny left the ministry, quit the ministry. And I heard a preacher say this. He said, I saw Danny in a Walmart store and didn't recognize him for when I first seen him. He looked like he did years ago. He said, I could tell he didn't want to see me. He didn't want to talk to me. He said, I come around there, and I said, Danny. And he said, Preacher, I didn't want to talk to you. I'm so ashamed. And I said, listen, Danny, David fell, and Samson fell, and God's mercy is new every morning. God can restore you, Danny. I mean, it'll never be like it ought to be, but God can restore you. No, no, I said, Preacher, you don't understand. He said, that my drug charges now. He said, what happened? He said, I went out, and he said, I... He said, after I got away from church, he said, I started dealing drugs again. He said, I got arrested the other day. And he said, I'm going up for 35 years. Are you listen to me? He said, preacher, they're not putting me up there in them, with them fags. Not putting me up there with a bunch of them sodomites. The preacher said, Danny, listen, man. We reap what we sow. But don't let the devil take you down that road. He said, preacher, I'm not going. I'm not going to pen. Three days later, Danny took a pistol, both brains out, before he had to go. You listen to me. When God tells you, be sober, be vigilant for your adversary. Walk with the battles, roaring lines, seeking whom he may devour. There is not a soul in this section 
that's exempt from that verse. There's not a soul in that section. There's not a soul behind that pulpit. There's not a soul out of this section, out of that section, that or that. I'm telling you, God. Peter, could you tell us anything from glory land today? Yes, Brother Reggie, the last thing I told those people in that letter was watch out. Some of you right now, if God doesn't do something, you're piddling. Let me tell you something, you're piddling. Let me give you an example. Forsake not the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is, but so much the more as the day approaches. Some of you is missing just a little bit now, but in five years you're going to be missing a whole bunch. And in ten years you won't be there, and your grandchildren will not even know their spiritual heritage because you are being played with by the devil. The devil has already kept, well, it's not necessary that I be faithful. Let me tell you something. You know how sorry and low down a Christian I am? Let me just tell you how wicked and low down and worthless I am. Brother Randy, I am so sorry and worthless that I cannot even walk with God right and have a TV in my home. I don't have a TV that won't play in my home because I'm spiritual. I don't have one in my house because I'm not spiritual. And the only thing I know to do is watch and be sober and be vigilant that I don't let the devil come in and devour my home. Now, I understand that some of you are so spiritual that you can watch anything. It just runs 24-7 around your house. You can just, it don't matter. I mean, you're so spiritual. And your kids are such little angels. It's not going to affect them to see all them queers and fags and idiots. It's not going to bother them, is it? No, I'll be honest with you. It's already getting some of you. You're playing with sin. And you need to repent of it. And what you need to do is wake up and say, God, I'll tell you one thing. From this day forward, it's not happening anymore. I'm going to be sober and watch, and I'm not going to let the devil come in and devour my life and my children. You see, it's serious. It's not funny when he devours them. I always think about that little lamb that I bought off my brother-in-law and put him down there by that fence. I tied him up. I fought close to the house, but you know what? The next morning, there was nothing left but little pieces of wool. And to this very day, it bothers me that I tied a lamb up and thought he'd be all right putting him out where the coyotes were. To this day, it bothers me what might have went through that little lamb's mind when he saw those glazing eyes of that coyote coming toward him. Will Reggie come? Will Reggie come? Will Reggie come? And let me tell you something, that little lamb is not worth spit compared to your soul. Fathers, could it be that down the hearts of your children they're saying, will daddy come? Will daddy come? Will daddy come? Let's stand together with our heads bowed and eyes closed this morning. Father in heaven, this morning we preached the best we best we knew what you wanted us to preach. God, my heart is grieved over what I see happen in this country. Dear Lord Jesus, I recognize myself today that if I'm not careful, if I don't stay vigilant, if I don't stay sober, that I'll let down my guard. And the things that I once said was wrong, I'll allow. The areas where I said there should be no compromise, I'll be compromising. And God, I just pray that you'll help me to resist the devil steadfastly in the faith. To use that wonderful sword of the Spirit and the shield of faith and the weapon of all prayer. God, I pray, take this message and use it to the blessings of these families, I ask in Jesus' name. As our heads are bowed this morning, do you have a need to come to this altar? Is there something you need to come do business with God about today? Have you been lax? Have you been compromising? You want to come you stay, right now. The altar's open. You got a, you got a need. You want to do business with God. You come now. Ain't going to be no piano playing. Ain't going to be no just as I am without one plea. I'm telling you, listen. If you've got business to do with God and you said this message is for me, I needed this message. I'll tell you what. The devil's been circling my home. The devil's been circling my heart. And he's out to devour me. And I tell you, God, I want to be sober and I want to be vigilant. And I want to use the, 
the shield of faith, and I want to use the sword of the Spirit. I want to resist him steadfastly. And you know that word, resist. Whom resist steadfastly in the faith? We just don't take it serious. I, listen, folks, nobody loves to have a greater time than I do. Nobody enjoys joy more than I do. But as I meditate, to be honest with you, I've been meditating on that verse for weeks. And it seemed like I could not preach. And yet last night, God changed my message. Last night, God said, now I'm going to let you preach on it in the morning. And I just want God to do what he wants today. If you're here today, I want to ask you something. Your head's about eyes closed. You're here today. You say, Pastor, the devil's circling. As far as I know, I'm lost. I'm not forgiven. I've never partaken of the mercy of God. I am guilty of standing guilty before God. I have not repented of my sin and trusted the Lord Jesus Christ as my Savior. And I'm lost and I'm a heartbeat from hell. I mean, I am one heartbeat from hell. Let me tell you something, dear friend. I don't preach this stuff to make, to make you mad, or, but I am trying to awaken your soul. There is truly a heaven and there is truly a hell. And if you die lost, you will honestly go there. Oh, how many times this week my heart rejoiced in thinking that it'd be, it's going to be easy to preach Brother Richard's service because he was a saved man. Brother, let me tell you something today. If you're here today and you're not saved, you must be born again. Except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. Are you here today like that and you need to be saved and you know you're lost? Would you slip your hand up so we know how to pray for you? I'm lost, Pastor. I'm without God. Anywhere in this building. Up high where I can see it. Up high where I can see it. I'm lost without God. I want to ask you a question this morning. You here in this building, all across this building, from end to end and side to side. How many in this building say, Brother Reggie, I'm aware that the devil is seeking whom he may devour. And by God's grace, I want to commit to resisting him steadfast in the faith. I do not want him to devour my family, my home, my life, my children, my marriage. In fact, I don't want him to devour this. Now, would you just slip your hand up in prayer to God? Let's pray together. Father in heaven, this morning, we bow, Lord, reverently and soberly this morning before you, Lord. Aware, Heavenly Father, that without your divine grace and power, we'll soon be devoured by the devil. But God, with you, Lord, with our great shepherd, He'll not come near us. Father, I pray help us today to stay close to the shepherd. Oh, God, help us not to wonder how far we can get away from the field, but how close we can be to the shepherd. I pray, God, today that you'd enable us by thy grace and thy word to stand fastly, resist the devil in the faith, the word of God. And Father, I'm asking you this morning that you would protect these homes, protect these marriages. I pray, God, no divorces in this church. I pray, God, not only no divorces, but their marriages will be a delight. I pray, God, that you'll cause us men to repent of being a bullheaded dictator and love our wives as you told us to love them. I pray, God, that you'd help us to love them, to be kind to them, God, to put them first after you. I pray to nurture them, protect them, and provide for them and make their life a joy. God, I pray that you give the wives of this church a submissive spirit. Oh, God, to serve, to love. God, to fulfill the God-given role that you've given him. Father, I pray that you'll help us to be stewards over our children, God, that you've entrusted us with. God, that we'd raise them in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, not in the customs and fads of this world. Oh, God, I pray, awaken those, Lord, this morning. Make us all see, God, that we think, we, we think we're all right. God, we, the devil can slip in also and wreck our lives. God, all around this country, it's happening everywhere around us. God, just this week, I heard of a man whose wife left him for another man. God, it just shocked me. I couldn't hardly imagine or believe it. And yet, God, it's just becoming so commonplace. Father, have mercy upon us. We need your grace. God, use this church. Strengthen these homes. Strengthen our hearts. And may we be sober and vigilant and watchful and st- Resist steadfastly the devil. God, help us to understand, Lord, if you told us that he's seeking the virus, you're not playing around about it. It's not a kid's play. It's not a joke. It's not a movie. And I thank you, Lord, for what you do. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to say something before this misses. I want to warn this church about something.